All right. Good morning, everyone. It's 10 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending. Looks like we're going to have a good turnout today, obviously, for a very good speaker that we're always happy to have back. So uh, welcome to our meeting. There we go. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, while the pandemic may be on its last legs, we still await uh, a notification of when we can return to the auditorium. So until then, uh, with the support of uh, myself and uh, John Tassie, we'll continue to provide the information via live stream on our regular meeting dates, the third uh, Saturday of each month. And uh, I have a slightly different slide for everybody today uh, in terms of introducing everybody. Um, our uh, officers and, and directors, if you'll see our pretty faces up on the left of this slide, are Bill Lewis, our president, who also does our newsletter meeting summaries. Jean Van Vliet, our director and hotline, uh, a, uh, uh, covers the hotline. Uh, myself, Aaron Lamb, director and meeting facilitator. Uh, Bill Manning, a director and videographer, and Stephen Pendergast, our secretary and newsletter editor. And to explain a little bit more about this slide, I'm going to, oh, hang on a second, I'm going to uh, unmute uh, Bill Lewis to tell us a little bit more. So, here we go. Bill, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, go ahead and um, tell us whatever bit, what we're seeing. Yes, uh, this is uh, one side of the new trifold brochure, uh, which we just had printed and is sitting in my living room waiting to be stuffed into envelopes. We're planning on sending out uh, three pieces to each member who has a California address in our records, uh, which is uh, 424 of us. Uh, so there'll be three of those brochures and uh, there will also be a bumper sticker, which we will show in a moment, uh, that, and we'll talk about there. But here's the other side of the trifold brochure, and uh, we hope that you can uh, share them with friends, uh, put them in doctor's offices, uh, put them anywhere that, uh, maybe even in a church, uh, anywhere that you think somebody might pick it up and be benefited from the information there. So here's a bumper sticker, which could also be applied to a window on a car, uh, on a store, uh, wherever you think it uh, might catch someone's attention. Prostate cancer, we can help. And we didn't type out IPCSG, uh, Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group, but we said a support group for informed decisions. And we have uh, my number on there, uh, I'll uh, try and um, accept the avalanche of car calls that will surely come in. So everybody will have at least one uh, brochure and feel free to ask for more. Um, that's my Google voice number and it doesn't seem to be accepting texts and I'll see if I can fix that. But in the meantime, please use Gene's hotline number that is on the first page of the website. So ask for extras if you if you want. We we're having a thousand printed, and uh, they'll be done uh, next week, and we'll be mailing out uh, uh, by the end of the month the uh, three brochures and the bumper sticker sample. Now we're also doing something else instead of our ads in the Union Tribune that we used to do. Um, it used to cost us, as I recall, $500 an ad and would put in two ads before each meeting, okay? For the equivalent price of four months of that, we're doing this grocery uh, store receipt advertisement. We're doing a test in the eight stores in the uh, San Diego area. And for your information, we're talking the Vons on Orange in Coronado, the Vons on Girard in La Jolla, the Vaughns on Bernardo Plaza in Rancho Bernardo, the Ralphs on University in Hillcrest, the Vaughns on Del Mar Heights in Del Mar, the Vaughns on Claremont Mesa in San Diego, the Vaughns on El Camino Real in Carlsbad, and the Vaughns on East Lake Parkway in Chula Vista. Now, these stores were carefully chosen by our sales rep, whose own father had prostate cancer 20 years ago, got treatment, and has been fine ever since. 
but she bent over backwards to pick these stores, which are stores that have the highest redemption rates. That is, people actually use the coupons on the back to get a McDonald's discount or, or a Baskin Robbins or whatever. So these are high response rate stores. And uh, the total number impressions in the three months, that is the number of, of spots on a grocery store ad where this uh, ad will show up is two and a half million in the next three months. So we're pretty excited about that. And uh, it offers uh, uh, prostate PSA testing information. Uh, we, we got an arrangement with a testing company that allows people to get that PSA test for just $12.95. So we're hopeful that people will really jump on that offer. Great, great. Yeah, Bill and the rest of the, uh, the the board have really put a lot of effort into you know the, the trifold uh, uh, brochure, uh, this this uh, grocery store receipt bumper stickers. You know, it it, uh, it it's really been a lot of, of great work. Thanks for doing that, and hopefully we'll be getting a, a ton of new members on account of this. Yeah, so thanks, Bill. Sure. Yeah. So. Further, our support to you comes in the way of our, uh, our website, ipcsg.org, uh, where you can also find the, the monthly newsletter that you'll also get by email. Those newsletters are fantastic, have a wealth of information in them, uh, a few jokes in the way of the cartoons uh, e each month, and um, you know, uh, also a, a wonderful meeting summary that, uh, uh, that Bill and, and Stephen work on. Um, really great um, uh, resource for, for you to, uh, to look at. And of course, we have our monthly video streamings on the, the third Saturdays of, uh, of the month. Um, in addition, we have the hotlines, as, as Bill mentioned. Uh, Bill and Jean have offered their phone numbers there for any, um, any, any member, any, any person that uh, would, would like some assistance uh, with um, especially a new diagnosis with prostate cancer you know, they can help you uh, uh, get in contact with uh, either themselves or, or somebody that can help answer some questions and uh, make sure that uh, you are doing everything you need to for um, uh, taking care of yourself. Uh, this is a, a great resource for, for people recently diagnosed. And recently, uh, we've also had Sharon offer to uh, give her uh, phone number for uh, a hotline. Uh, specifically for women, family, and caregivers, um, because it is also a very uh, difficult and new situation for them. Um, and she has a lot of tips uh, that can help as well. And we do need volunteers. Uh, we need people to help recruit and schedule speakers and to share your experience. Those of you that tuned in last month or watched uh, the, uh, the meeting uh, offline know that we had a fantastic turnout, fantastic meeting went on for, I think, two and a half hours with uh, uh, great presentations by three of our members on their uh, recent and, uh, you know, multi-decade experiences. And um, had a, we had a lot of questions that we were able to answer from the audience. It, it really shows uh, how important those roundtable meetings are and how important it is to share your experience uh, with what you've been through. Uh, we could also use more volunteers to take uh, hotline calls. Um, please just contact us at the website or uh, the uh, uh, Jean's phone number, I believe, that you see there. And that number is also available on the website. So our support group purpose is we share patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager through informing, networking, and caring. We're not, we are a group of experienced participants and we are not medical professionals. And so any sharing by any one of our group may not be a substitute for your own medical counsel. And we do need your support. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So all of your donations are tax deductible. We have no medical or religious affiliations. And during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, while we are video streaming our meetings, our costs remain very much the same keeping up our website uh, and uh, having the Zoom meeting license. Um, and as Bill described, a, a lot of our um, uh, efforts to get the word out. So please do consider making a donation. You can do that online from the website via PayPal, or you can send a check to the address that you see there. And that address is also available on the website. 
in terms of our upcoming meetings, uh, next month we'll have Dr. Tanya Dorf. Uh, she'll be giving some updates on immunotherapy. And further out in June, we'll have a representative from Telex Pharmaceuticals. However, for today, we have uh, Dr. Richard Lamb that uh, probably all of you know, because uh, he has been a recurring speaker uh, for us. Uh, Dr. Lamb is with Prostate Oncology Specialists. He's a double board certified internist and oncologist, uh, has been specializing full-time at Prostate Oncology Specialists in the treatment of prostate cancer since 2001. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lamb. And, uh, but before that, actually, uh, please do uh, go ahead and use the Q&A functions to submit, uh, the, sorry, the Q&A uh, window to submit any questions that you have. And we'll have Dr. Lamb answer those at the uh, end of his presentation. And uh, with that, please, Dr. Lamb, take it away. Great, thank you, Aaron. So let's see here, let me turn on the, my slides, do you guys, so you guys see my screen well, titled uh, Metastatic Prostate Cancer? Uh, I don't see it. Um, let's try the- You might need to reshare, because I- Yeah, maybe that, that might do the trick. Ah. There we go. And if you just start presentation mode, I think we'll be all set. Great. Perfect. So good morning. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure and honor to, you know, give you guys uh, interact and talk with you guys and talk about what's new in prostate cancer. So thank you for having me again. Uh, the topic today will be a on the surface a little uh, glum topic, but there's a lot to be excited about in this field called metastatic prostate cancer. So uh, let's start with classifying <clears throat> the various types of metastatic prostate cancer because each different classification has a uh, different prognosis. So the first type I would clarify, uh, I'd like to emphasize is the type called regional lymph node involvement. So this is cancer that has spread to the lymph nodes uh, near the prostate. So these uh, lymph nodes involve, uh, the lymph nodes involved typically are called the uh, pelvic lymph nodes, or some people call them iliac lymph nodes, presacral lymph nodes, obturator nodes. And for these patients, um, we treat aggressively, and oftentimes these patients can live anywhere, you know, uh, up to 10, 15 years. And in some cases, even with metastatic regional lymph node involvement, we can even have these patients cured. The next category of metastatic uh, cancer involves uh, typically the bones only. So uh, this, the, the second to the lymph nodes, uh, skeletal involvement by prostate cancer is the uh, a very common uh, area of involvement. And for men with cancer that is in the bones, uh, traditionally we are uh, able to control the cancer for 10, uh, actually, you know, anywhere as little as two to three years, but oftentimes up to 10 years. And we can give a patient an idea of how successful we will be depending on the number of spots as well as the location of the cancer. Uh, the next category uh, of cancer metastatic uh, involvement involves the what we call the organs, or another term is visceral involvement. And the most common areas of visceral involvement are the liver and lungs. Um, in the olden days, um, the prognosis of visceral involvement is not good, uh, where we were estimating the uh, survival is uh, only approximately two to three years. Uh, fortunately, with newer drugs, we, especially you know, with uh, cancer in the lungs, I, I have patients uh, with long-term control uh, with metastatic lung cancer, uh, prostate to the lungs, up to 10 years, actually. And this goes to, uh, um, which leads me to segues into the next category of metastatic disease is something called a, a new category, which we call oligometastatic disease. Uh, that is defined as metastatic disease in just a few spots, uh, either in the bones, the lung, the lymph nodes, 
but not many. So typically less than five spots. And in the this is a category not about where the cancer is. This is more about the category of how much cancer there is. And in these cases, uh, the prognosis can be anywhere between you know, years uh, to even potential cure for metastatic disease, as long as it's in the oligometastatic category. So to, to uh, describe or to quantify and look for uh, metastatic disease, we need uh, ways to see it. Um, it's not just a PSA rising, um, we need to actually confirm that there's visible cancer on some sort of scans. Um, back, going back as far as 20, 30 years ago, uh, the only types of scans would be the first uh, couple, which is the uh, CT scans, or uh, otherwise known as computed tomography, and MRI scans, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, these are uh, fairly good, but not tremendously sensitive at finding cancer, typically in the lymph nodes and the organs. And to a certain extent, they're, they're okay at finding a cancer in the bones. Um, a old but uh, standard bone scan uh, it's, is what we typically use. It's called the T99 bone scan, where we uh, have the patients, um, they, they, uh, a is radioactive isotope called technetium 99 is injected and um, an hour, a couple hours later, a scan is taken. And so um, that is a, uh, the standard for looking for cancer in the bones. So traditionally, a, a standard workup for metastatic disease would be a CAT scan or an MRI to look for soft tissue disease and a nuclear T99 bone scan. Approximately uh, eight, eight, nine years ago, um, the, the field of PET imaging has uh, improved. And the first PET scan that was um, accepted and, and uh, found to be useful is the carbon 11 type PET scans. And I bet some of the attendees remember you know, going to the Mayo Clinic or going to Dr. Almeida in Phoenix to, to uh, have that scan. Uh, the, the scan is, um, it's either carbon uh, 11 acetate or carbon 11 choline. And these PET scans were more sensitive than the traditional CAT scan MRIs and, and bone scans in detecting metastatic disease. About five years ago, a, a next generation PET scan called the Aximan PET scan using a, what we call the flucyclovone um, radioactive nucleotide was FDA approved. And that was a, a bridge, um, a, a, a fairly good test, fairly equivalent to the carbon 11 PET scan uh, that was approved and widely available throughout the country rather than just in certain specific uh, centers. So uh, cer certainly there are physicians ordering uh, Axman PET scans as a convenient, uh, pretty sensitive way to look for metastatic disease. Um, luckily in the last couple of years, and, and more recently, uh, the PSMA PET scan uh, has become um, not only uh, more widely used and FDA approved, uh, so the PSMA PET scan has become the new standard of care for looking for metastatic disease. So there's two types of isotopes which are used in this uh, nuclear test. One is the gallium-68 PET scan, which is done at uh, UCLA and UCSF. The, uh, I see the more um, popular one coming up is called the F18 PYL PSA PET scan, PSMA PET scan, which it's a easier isotope to manage and therefore will be available in more centers. So even in San Diego area, there's probably at least 15 to 20 centers already offering this PSMA uh, PYL PET scan. So um, when one would typically use these PET scans, um, obviously when one relapses after some sort of treatment to look for metastatic disease, but these PET scans are also being used uh, prior to uh, some sort of uh, treatment to the prostate to make sure there is no metastatic cancer prior to treating the prostate, aka the mothership.
So another uh, topic I like to brush up on is to you know talk about different types of metastatic cancer in terms of not only about the location, but there are other ways to categorize if a metastatic prostate cancer is aggressive or not aggressive. One, uh, one way is to look at the Gleason score. As you may recall, the Gleason score is basically a sample that is biopsied via needle from the prostate and looked under the microscope. And the Gleason score was developed by Dr. Gleason, who um, set up a, a way of evaluating the aggressiveness of cancer by uh, via uh, looking at the cells under a microscope and, and being able to tell if the cancer cells look aggressive or not. So a Gleason score uh, is uh, biopsies, uh, is uh, obtained by doing a biopsy of the prostate. Now, if you had a biopsy of a lymph node, of a bone, uh, the Gleason score is not applicable. They only will tell you if uh, the biopsies of lymph nodes and bones will tell you if it's cancer or not, uh, and it will tell you if it's aggressive looking or not, but the pathologist typically will not give a Gleason score. Um, a next uh, prognostic indicator for aggressive versus non-aggressive prostate cancer would be a PSA level. So the higher the PSA uh, typically is very correlating with the aggressiveness of the cancer. So if a patient with metastatic disease whose PSA is less than one, he will have a less aggressive, better prognostic prognosis cancer than someone who had a PSA of uh, less than 10 versus less than 20, or someone with a PSA of triple digits. As alluded to earlier, the number of spots seen on the scan is also a very uh, strong uh, indicator of aggressiveness. And as indicated, as discussed earlier, uh, visceral versus bone or lymph nodes is also uh, prognostic. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, cancer in the liver, uh, multiple bone areas uh, would be more um, aggressive than, for example, just a couple lymph nodes in the pelvic region or just one skeletal metastasis. Finally, there's uh, more modern ways to describe prostate cancer aggressiveness is via genetic testing. And um, I'll just leave it at that because we, we did have a genetic testing lecture about a year ago that I'll refer you to. Um, uh, at, I, I did give a, a lecture about a year and a half ago at, at your group. So you can look at the slides for that and, and that will also help you learn about the genetics of prostate cancer and how it is used to help with prognosis and treatment. So, just wanted to show some slides of uh, various types of metastatic disease. If you look at the panel on your left, um, this is a, a nuclear scan, a PET scan of a patient with only one spot in the bone. This is what we call oligometastatic disease. These three uh, black areas are is just the kidneys and the liver uh, and the bladder, which is how these uh, isotopes is excreted through the urine. This is the liver, this is the spleen, but this is the one met metastatic uh, lesion seen on the PET scan. And on the, um, this image, this is a, a different type of looking at it. Uh, you could see there's a bright spot uh, where the red arrow is. Uh, the panel on your right is just a uh, nuclear T99 bone scan showing uh, cancer in the bones. And this is obviously uh, more than five spots, therefore not what we call oligometastatic disease. This is a this is a uh, PSMA PET scan um, showing cancer that is uh, in the lymph nodes. These little black dots here, uh, some lymph nodes here, and um, and also the bones. So these are spots in the bones. And you can see on the, uh, the other imaging way, uh, these are lymph node involvement, and this is bony involvement. These are lymph node involvement, and this is bony involvement. So these, are, these two panels are of a CT scan of a gentleman with lymph node involvement. You see these dots here, these are enlarged lymph nodes. So a lymph node is typically considered normal if it's less than one centimeter. 
but these lymph nodes are, are approximately two and a half, three centimeters, and therefore the radiologist would call, call this a lymph node um, involvement. On the panel on your right, the, the liver here is, uh, is involved with four uh, tumors of metastasis from prostate cancer. So going back to uh, the different categories of metastatic disease, I uh, just wanted to emphasize that uh, regional lymph node metastasis is a potentially curable condition. And the typical scenarios one would try to cure prostate cancer in the lymph node is, uh, one of them is if a patient underwent uh, prostatectomy and uh, after the patient, uh, after the surgery was, was finished, the pathologist looks at the lymph nodes that were removed and discovered that uh, there's some cancer in the lymph nodes. And in this situation, it turns out that approximately one in five men who have cancer in the lymph nodes that were removed can actually have a very long-term remission. And if you um, only have one lymph node involved, the remission duration uh, is on average more than four years. So even if you're not cured, you're likely to be in remission for four or five years before the cancer relapses. So how do we improve upon these numbers? It turns out that if one were to then add radiation uh, to the pro uh, prostate bed and pelvis and consider using androgen deprivation therapy, the cure rate for this scenario is actually closer to 40-50%. Another scenario where uh, lymph node involvement is curable is a patient who uh, preoperatively or pre-treatment underwent a scan and was found to have one or two lymph nodes in the pelvis involved. In this case, one could forego the surgery and just go with radiation alone. Uh, so radiate, uh, the radiation would involve radiating the prostate and the pelvis where the lymph node is, and then adding 18 to 30 mo 36 months of androgen deprivation therapy. And also now the standard of care is adding what we call a second generation androgen receptor inhibitor. So this is a radiation centric approach, uh, which involves the uh, addition of androgen deprivation therapy. But the advantage of this approach is one can be spared of surgery and its side effects, including incontinence and erectile dysfunction. So the big question is now that we know a couple, that cancer involving the lymph nodes in the prostate area is curable, um, how about if there is uh, distant metastatic disease away from the prostate region uh, or the pelvis? So is what we call oligometastatic disease curable? So for example, that patient where I showed the slide where he had one, lymph, uh, one spot in the bones, is that person who has metastatic disease curable? Well, that is a open-ended question at this point. We, we need, a, uh, obviously the definition of cure is um, the lack of relapse many, many years down the road. So with, with that in mind, we therefore uh, need many, many years of follow-up before we dare to say oligometastatic disease is curable. However, we have learned that in with, treatment of oligometastatic disease, uh, we can delay relapse. We could also delay the condition called castrate resistant prostate cancer or CRPC. And so far we have seen long-term re remissions in the four or five year range. So how does treating metastatic or oligometastatic disease, uh, how is that done? Well, it's similar to how we treat lymph node involved uh, prostate cancer. Of course, we would need to treat the prostate and depending on where the oligomet is located, we either treat with surgery, removal of the lymph node, uh, or radiation, uh, either via uh, radiating the whole pelvis, or we use what we call stereotactic radiotherapy, which is radiation uh, de uh, uh, delivered with high dosages in a very pinpoint manner to the uh, metastatic spot. And then we also use uh, what we call systemic treatment to treat the, the invisible metastatic disease that is not that we can't see on the scans. 
and to uh, potentially suppress and prevent those invisible spots from coming back. So this is a, a, a little, uh, many, many of you guys have seen the, um, a timeline of, of prostate cancer. And I just wanna direct your attention to this curve right here where you see all these humps along the way. And we're, we're going to go through a timeline where when a patient presents with uh, local disease, we call this primary disease and we treat the prostate. And let's say we treated the prostate and the patient relapsed uh, with the PSA rising and we uh, highly suspect there's still some cancer within the prostate. So this is treating uh, the prostate area again via salvage treatment. So typically the timeline for failed salvage treatment is the PSA starts rising and then with the correct imaging, we find hopefully just oligometastatic disease, just a few spots or hopefully just one or two. And then the question is, if we treated at this point, what would happen to this gentleman? Or as opposed to what if we didn't treat? So if we didn't treat this gentleman with oligometastatic disease, he will become polymetastatic disease. So treating the oligometastatic disease will delay polymetastatic disease and keep the PSA low and will very likely delay uh, metastatic disease, uh, a metastatic castrate resistant disease and delay uh, subsequent treatments. We'll basically move all this curve further to the right. So delay all these bad things that are potentially going to happen. So that's where the uh, rationale for uh, treatment of oligometastatic disease comes from. And potentially if we're fortunate, we could treat the oligometastatic disease and the cancer remains in remission forever. Unfortunately, um, cure in the metastatic setting is not common. So um, we hope to cure metastatic disease, but at this point in men who are, who are unable to cure, we have to accept that metastatic disease is typically managed like a chronic condition. So to manage a chronic condition, you definitely want to balance um, success of treatment, survival with potential side effects. So we, to manage chronic disease, we typically use medications which are successful in shrinking cancer, not just preventing growth, but shrinking it, and obviously preventing it from growing. And treating systemic disease with medications does prolong survival. We're talking about years of survival here. Um, we also will implement radiation therapy uh, sometimes to just simply treat symptoms. So if someone has metastatic cancer and there's uh, discomfort or um, urinary problems or back pain or bone pain, we can use radiation therapy to treat, um, treat the symptoms. Uh, sometimes uh, as, as uh, evidenced by a trial called the STOMP trial, if a patient really wants to avoid androgen deprivation therapy and other medications, and the cancer is not too aggressive, the metastatic disease is not too aggressive, we can <clears throat> use selectively use radiation therapy to um, radiate the, the hot spots and maybe even delay uh, the need for using medications such as androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, radiation therapy in the form of what, what I call liquid radiation um, has been shown to improve survival now. So it's not just to treat pain or prevent use of ADT, but radiation therapy can also prolong survival, which we'll touch upon that in a little bit. So the primary treatment of metastatic disease is ADT, which means androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, we know that uh, testosterone uh, feeds prostate cancer. And the use of androgen deprivation therapy by, by the sound of the words is to deprive the cancer cells of testosterone and which leads to what we call programmed cell death. Most of our androgens or testosterone comes from our testicles, but the remaining 10% of uh, testosterone and other androgens comes from the adrenal glands. So this little slide here just basically shows a um, 
the brain here stimulates hormones to um, to the testicles to encourage the testicles and the, to create testosterone. The adrenal glands create testosterone on their own. Testosterone and androgens um, come from the testicles and the adrenal glands go into the prostate cancer cells and stimulate the cells to replicate DNA and subsequently uh, replicate. So this is just a, a little slide of uh, what I just described earlier. And the, I think I gave a lecture on testosterone um, androgen deprivation a couple of years ago, so you could refer to that. But these are some of the common uh, drugs that we use and uh, called LHRH agonists that we use or urologists use to treat metastatic prostate cancer. And you, you guys probably heard of Lupron, Zolodex, Trilstar. A next generation uh, androgen deprivation therapy is called the LHRH antagonist. And these are treatments that um, um, work slightly different manner, but at the end of the day, still decrease testosterone levels from the testicles. And the most common drug for that purpose is a drug called Degarelex or Firmigon. It's a monthly injection and uh, which uh, works very quickly um, just uh, to lower the testosterone level. And about a year ago, a new drug called Relagolix, which is called Orgovix, is a daily oral pill, which does the same thing. Both of these drugs lower testosterone a lot quicker than the uh, agonist that we talked about on the earlier slide. And we typically use this for patients um, who we don't want to, don't, we don't need to use uh, Casadex to prevent the flare. We also use it when we want a person to respond quickly. So for example, if we're worried that this man will have um, paralysis from cancer pushing on the spinal cord and we want something to work quickly, we would use these drugs. Another scenario where a patient has severe urinary symptoms related to prostate cancer in the prostate, we can shrink the cancer quickly by using these two drugs. One disadvantage of, um, a couple disadvantages of these two drugs are uh, the Firmagon is a once a month injection into the belly. Um, it is rather painful and there's a little bit of a red welt uh, that develops and, and lasts for a couple weeks. So, um, and there's no three or six month formulation just yet. Um, on the other hand, the uh, Relagolix or Orgovix is a convenient pill that you can take, um, but it is a pill that needs to be taken every day to maintain its effect. And because it's fairly new, um, not all insurances are covering it. And um, as a result, uh, it, the out of pocket could be quite expensive. Uh, both of these drugs, as well as the uh, all these uh, prior drugs we talked about that are injections, they all cause the same side effects of low testosterone. And I gave a lecture on side effects of low testosterone in the past that you could refer to as well. I think it was called the androgen deprivation therapy lecture. But primarily, the side effects of low testosterone or low T are lower libido, potentially increased obesity, lower muscle mass. Um, mild anemia, hot flashes. Um, so a lot of the symptoms of uh, very similar and, and actually an osteoporosis as well. So very similar to uh, when, a, when a lady goes through uh, menopause. So low T symptoms, side effects are very similar to menopausal side effects. So this was the original method of androgen deprivation therapy that we, we still do in our office if you dare to come up to Marina Del Rey. So these are some other treatments that we use nowadays to improve upon first line androgen deprivation therapy. And these include um, abiraterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide, olaparib, chemotherapy, and radiation. So each of these drugs is can are um, interventions are used in the in there's two settings where these interventions can be used. One is a when the patient has metastatic disease and we give androgen deprivation therapy for the first time when they are what we call castrate sensitive. If you add these drugs, uh, 
there are better outcomes in using androgen deprivation by itself. The other scenario where we use drugs such as olaparib is when patients become what we call castrate resistance, when first line androgen deprivation stops working and we need to come up with other options. So this is a, a basic description of what we call sensitive versus resistant metastatic cancer. Castrate sensitive cancer is when the cancer still responds and shrinks when we remove testosterone using androgen deprivation therapy. Resistant is when the cancer no longer responds uh, to uh, androgen deprivation therapy. In other words, typically it's when a patient is on androgen deprivation therapy and the PSA starts going up and new spots start showing. Back to the uh, castrate sensitive metastatic cancer situation. So if a patient presents with metastatic disease and he's never had androgen deprivation therapy before, the first line of treatment is ADT. But in the, uh, since 2015, we've learned that multiple different drugs added to ADT indeed prolong survival, delayed resistance, delayed uh, cancer pain and improved quality of life by adding these drugs to ADT. So the first drug that was um, shown to improve outcomes on top of ADT was docetaxel, which is chemotherapy. So patients took chemotherapy for about four months um, and um, in addition to androgen deprivation. And the group that took chemotherapy lived longer by approximately a year or so. Subsequently, they uh, studied the next group of drugs called abiraterone, enzalutamide, and apalutamide. These three drugs are all what we call second generation androgen receptor inhibitors. Um, these are also uh, drugs that work in the hormonal axis. And in the old, prior to them being used in the sensitive situation, we use these drugs as a backup plan when ADT stopped working. So what we subsequently found since 2017 is don't wait for ADT to stop working before you use these drugs. Why don't you add these drugs to ADT initially when the cancer is still sensitive to ADT? So what we found that is adding any one of these three drugs tends to prolong survival about the same amount as adding chemotherapy to ADT. So we're talking about a year or two of extra survival when you use these upfront rather than in the castrate resistance setting. So nowadays, the standard is to use ADT and on top of that, add one of these four agents, chemotherapy or the next three agents below, abiraterone, enzalutamide, or apalutamide. And each one has its particular pros and cons and um, we have different rationale for using which treatment. Um, each treatment has its own uh, side effect profile. So we typically choose one of the four that you guys see right here on this slide. Um, what we've learned though is uh, in the more, in, more recently in 2021 and 2022, it turns out that if you add the second generation androgen receptor inhibitors such as abiraterone in the PEACE trial of 2021, or darolutamide in the Arison's trial of 2022, if you add these agents to chemotherapy alone, plus, uh, and everyone got ADT. So everyone got ADT and chemotherapy. But if you added abiraterone or if you added darolutamide, the outcomes of survival were better when you add these two on top of chemotherapy. So the conclusion from these more recent trials is for patients, for patients, select patients, I would say, if you give a patient uh, ADT and you give chemotherapy, you might wanna consider adding abiraterone or darolutamide because these trials are showing that patients do indeed live longer if you use all these upfront. Um, so typically for men with very aggressive metastatic disease, men who are younger, who we feel that can tolerate all the treatment, uh, we would offer this very aggressive multi-pronged approach. So the chemotherapy is for four months. 
but one would stay on the abiraterone or the darolutamide plus ADT indefinitely. So again, uh, just trying to, all this aggressive treatment with ADT and now adding the uh, second generation drugs is to delay castrate resistant prostate cancer, delay more bone mets and delay uh, death. So now let's say a patient has been on uh, androgen deprivation therapy and it has stopped working. So as defined by um, what I said earlier, a rising PSA worsening cancer while on androgen deprivation therapy. So we could also, at this point, we, if we hadn't used these drugs earlier, we would use these drugs now as uh, plan B and plan C. Often, and then we, then treatment uh, in CRPC is kind of a, a stepwise uh, treatment. And each treatment, unfortunately, doesn't work forever. It works for anywhere between months and a couple years at keeping the cancer in check. But hormonal drugs is still a treatment for castrate-resistant metastatic disease. Um, we also sometimes incorporate chemotherapy, which is taxotere and now a, a slightly newer uh, chemotherapy called Jeptana. Uh, we also use PARP inhibitors, which are um, used in cancers that have a specific genetic defect in the DNA repair genes. And these include the BRCA genes, uh, uh, the ATM genes, the FANCA genes. So these genes are tested either in the blood or from the cancer itself. And again, I'll refer you to the genetic test, um, the genetic testing lecture I gave about a year ago for that. But PARP inhibitors uh, work in a targeted fashion to about, uh, and, it, and if you look hard enough, about one out of three patients can be treated with PARP inhibitors in this setting. Liquid radiation uh, initially was, uh, the, the concept of liquid radiation is in the past when someone has cancer in a spot, we would take the beam radiation and direct it at the spot to relieve pain or uh, prevent some catastrophic symptoms. Um, but the next generation radiation is in actually the form of liquid. So the radiation is actually comes in a little vial and is injected into veins and the, the radiation is delivered into the bloodstream, uh, into, uh, via the bloodstream directly into the cancer. So the first um, liquid radiation that was shown to improve survival is called radium-223 or Zofigo. I'll, I'll, I wanna step back just a bit. The prior, there, there has been liquid radiations um, in the past um, called uh, quant, uh, Quadramet, as being one of the drugs was used to treat pain. So if you give someone liquid radiation, it will cut down on bone pain. But radium-223 or Zofigo was the first liquid radiation that actually prolonged survival in addition to decreasing uh, bone pain. And this is used in men who only have cancer in the bones as this uh, radioisotope only goes into the bones. So if you have liver metastasis, lung metastasis, a lot of lymph node metastasis, the radium-223 will not uh, penetrate those uh, cancers, so it will not make a dent. So in those patients uh, with more widespread non-bone prostate cancer, um, we have now we have lutetium-177 uh, finally approved uh, as of last month. So this liquid radiation uh, treats cancer in the bones, lymph nodes, liver, lung, wherever the cancer may be, and wherever the um, uh, the blood will go to basically. And this uh, treatment uh, will uh, decrease symptoms and has been shown to prolong survival as well. Uh, we've been working with lutetium-177 for about five, six years. And um, we've seen um, short or, you know, it doesn't always work. So we've seen short responses, a couple months, but we've also seen uh, with longer follow-up, patients have been in, re in remission for over a year with this treatment. Um, overall, um, the patients who uh, qualify for, for this treatment are the people who do a PSMA PET scan and the cancer lights up via the PSMA PET scan because lutetium 
uh, goes after the cancer cells that express PSMA. Side effects are, are fairly low, uh, dry mouth, uh, mild constipation, mild anemia, and, um, and could cause some anemia as well and other uh, blood count related uh, parameters. But overall, it's, it's well tolerated. In my opinion, it's better tolerated than chemotherapy. Um, so this is one of the arrows in our quiver. Another arrow in our quiver is immunotherapy, which uh, luckily you'll hear more about when Dr. Dorff speaks uh, next month. But briefly, I want to go over some options. Uh, Provenge, which is, this, uh, which is actually one of the first immunotherapies developed for any cancer, was approved for prostate cancer approximately 10 years ago. And it's still used to a certain extent now. Um, it is used in men with, with uh, less aggressive, low volume metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And it has been shown to prolong overall survival. A couple other immunotherapies, one is what we call pembrolizumab or Keytruda. Um, that's used and is FDA approved in any cancers that have what we call microsatellite instability. Uh, or high tumor mutation burden. And that's part of the genetic testing lecture that I gave earlier, and Dr. Dorff will expand upon that. But uh, pembrolizumab or Keytruda is approved uh, for certain, num certain types of prostate cancers. And the take home message is with correct testing, uh, one, about one in 20 men will have these genetic mutations that will benefit from Keytruda. So in other words, um, Keytruda is at this point only going to be uh, approved and uh, for about one out of 20 people with metastatic prostate cancer, but it is available if uh, you qualify. So it's important to remind your doctors to test for um, sensitivity or um, response to Keytruda. They'll, they'll know what you mean. Um, there's some new studies showing uh, the combination of ipilimumab um, and nivolumab, uh, a common uh, combination immunotherapy we use for uh, melanoma and lung cancer. But there is some data using it for prostate cancer. Approximately one in five men will have an excellent response. And I'll let uh, Dr. Dorff talk about that at the uh, next meeting. And finally, um, in addition to uh, trying to prolong survival, we, you know, since metastatic disease tends to go to the bones, we often impl or implement uh, medicines that protect the bones, decrease fracture risk, decrease bone loss, decrease bone pain. And these drugs are called zolindronic acid or zometa uh, intravenously or uh, denusumab or also called Prolia or Exgeva. These drugs are used to protect the bones as well, and they're injected uh, into the arm once a month. Uh, these are some of the new uh, potential uh, drugs and developments in the setting of metastatic disease. Um, actinium is a um, second generation liquid radiation, which uh, might be used um, if lutetium stops working, or instead of lutetium someday, um, because it seems to have less side effects. We, we don't know um, if it's better or just equivalent, but I suspect it's at least equivalent with less side effects. This is a, a new drug that um, is injected that targets the PSMA uh, type cancer cells, but it also, it's radiation plus immunotherapy um, as a promising approach. And they're working on new PARP inhibitors. And a very interesting uh, drug uh, combination is the use of olaparib plus abiraterone in combination, even in men who don't have the specific gene mutations. There's some promising data showing that you don't have to have the gene mutations that qualify for PARP, but if you use the PARP and the abiraterone together, you're, you will have better outcomes. So we need a little bit more data on that before it becomes a um, standard uh, uh, offering to patients. So on that note, um, just want to thank you for your attention. I uh, hope you've learned a little bit about metastatic disease and the range uh, of conditions in terms of uh, curability and um, you know 
definitely lots of options to prolong survival and keep this cancer in check. Thank you very much. Thanks, doctor. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get my video started again here. There we go. Um, uh, why don't you go ahead and um, and uh, stop sharing your screen and, and hopefully your video will pop back up. I'm not sure if it's just, oh, it is just me. Your video is on there. And um, we can answer some questions. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. I don't think I have actually seen such a comprehensive summary of so many different treatment options um, all at once. You know, when I started Zytiga a few years ago, certainly that was like just when um, uh, uh, others were, uh, other drugs were starting to come out. But like, I, I've never seen such a list of, of different options that are available to everybody. So uh, it's, it's so encouraging that we have so many different um, avenues of, of treatment. And there's been so, so much advances in, in the treatment of prostate cancer in, in recent days. Yes, um, definitely. A lot, yeah. lot of reason to be optimistic, for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, let me actually kick off uh, one um, question that, that has been on my mind a little bit. You know, I've, I've heard over the last couple of years about lutetium um, and it's now, you know, finally approved and so forth. But I guess what is the optimal, I guess, patient? It's kind of like, uh, 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 what's the threshold at which, you know, like a, a patient would, would um, best be suited by treatment uh, uh, with lutetium? Sure. So the, the official, at this point, the official guideline and approval is for men with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer who have had had Taxotere chemotherapy. Hmm. So in terms of sequencing, we are not using it in the early stage yet. So, um, and that's how all of these metastatic drugs, um, they all go through this process of using, uh, getting it approved for patients who have very little options left, and usually it's after chemotherapy. And so once these drugs are approved for after chemotherapy, they, they start, uh, or they're already doing studies using it for before chemotherapy. And they're, they're going to use it for newly diagnosed metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer. So in general, um, and, you know, so I, at this point, it is after chemotherapy is the only way you can get the drug. Uh, now, after chemotherapy doesn't mean chemotherapy has to stop working. It, one could take a couple doses of chemotherapy and not tolerate it, and that would be considered after chemotherapy. A man could have chemotherapy and respond extremely well, and months later, the cancer comes back, you can use lutetium. So the patient just has to have had a whiff of chemotherapy to qualify. So let's say we, we are able to get the patient treated. Does that mean we should give it to anybody who even had a whiff of chemotherapy? No. Then you talk about, you got to weigh the risks and benefit of a treatment. So if a patient has a hundred spots lighting up like a Christmas tree, then injecting a little liquid radiation sounds like a very logical, good bang for the buck treatment. Uh, so that, that would be a good scenario to use it. On the other hand, if a patient has one or two spots, oligometastatic, even if they're castrate resistant, do we want to use it so early and potentially harm the bone marrow? Or, or should we wait till, should we try something else? Should we try SBRT, for example, or try some other approaches that are, um, th that, that close, that don't close the door for future use of lutetium? save oh, it for a little bit later. So lutetium can only be used once? You, it's a treatment course. And the treatment course is potentially six treatments. Okay. okay. So um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to, the more you use it, the more uh, the radiation could potentially hurt your bone marrow. Okay. And so um, you, you typically use six treatments and they're studying it, whether or not they should use more, you know, like, just like the Zofigo, they did a six treatment versus 12 treatment. But um, I, I suspect we'll be able to use it again, but we need a lot more data for that. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, we've got the questions rolling in. Do you, do you have the Q&A uh, uh, window in, in front yes. of you? Yes, yes, so I see uh, six questions. I'll just start from the top. Yeah, and go ahead and read them through because I'm not sure everyone in the audience uh, gets to see them as well. Sure, sure. So um, 
Douglas G is asking, uh, I am on Abiraterone now for almost four years, walking a lot to combat bone loss. I would like to try transdermal uh, test, uh, estrogen to add back a physiologic level of estradiol. I am encountering resistance from doctors, yet patch trials suggest good levels of estradiol are no worse than ADT for cardiovascular problems. My thoughts. Okay, so um, the, the concept of t uh, using estrogen is it, it's a multi-pronged process. It, it has multiple uh, edges of sword, so to speak, to think about. Um, the benefit of estrogen is uh, just like for women, estrogen does help with uh, prevent bone loss. It also helps with hot flashes and um, overall improved quality of life. The downside is it can cause uh, gynecomastia, which is breast enlargement. And uh, especially with the oral estrogen, there's been a lot of data showing that people, men and women who take estrogen, they have a higher risk of blood clots, uh, like heart attacks, uh, strokes, and blood clots in the lungs. So when you give, when you take estrogen, you've got some benefit, but the potential risk is death from blood clots. So a lot of doctors are, are quite nervous to give estrogen patch, uh, estrogen. Um, I do think that estrogen patches, I use the lowest possible dose is something to, I, I, I do that sometimes because I do think the risk of estrogen patch on cardiovascular uh, blood clot problems are fairly low. Um, but I wouldn't say it's uh, completely, it's zero. And anyone with metastatic disease, you also got to remember, you're at an increased risk of uh, uh, heart attacks and strokes and blood clots are ready for metastatic disease. So if you add a little estrogen, that might be the, the, the factor that tips you into getting a blood clot. So yeah, you gotta think twice about it, but low dose estrogen patches um, can be considered. And the last thing I wanna touch upon is back in the olden days when we didn't have all these new medications, we would use high dose estrogen pills or patches. We had patients slapping on six, seven patches on their, on their body just to get super doses of estrogen. And we've seen responses, uh, cancer responses in about one out of four people. So lot, estrogen is a very interesting compound. Treats symptoms, occasionally treats the cancer, but you gotta be aware of the side effects, including uh, blood clots and breast growth. Okay, next question is, um, Oh, good. So once I answer the question, is um, Aaron just getting rid of it? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. That, that helps a lot. <laughs> okay. So um, what is your um, current opinion about BAT? So um, BAT is basically the use of high dose uh, testosterone um, in the castrate uh castrate resistant metastatic setting. I think it's called bipolar androgen treatment or something. So this approach was, um, there was some data about three years ago in um, at the National Cancer uh, Institute uh, in Bethesda about, you know, cancer cells evolve and they become so strange after being treated with androgen deprivation therapy that in some cases, the cancers even respond to the giving of testosterone rather than removal of testosterone. So that was really exciting a couple of years ago. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any long-term follow-up or more follow-up data on that approach. Um, the data basically said about, and I think I covered that on one of my lectures a couple of years ago, um, about one out of six men uh, will have a transient response when you give that patient uh, super high doses of testosterone. Um, unfortunately, there were a lot of a lot higher risk of heart attacks and strokes. So, you know, with all the new treatments, I guess if if a patient had absolutely no options, um, I would remotely consider using that. We definitely need a lot more data on that before we start offering uh, these sick patients testosterone. Mm -hmm. 
Um, next question from Pat is, is there the opportunity to get copy? Oh, yes. So of course, uh, you guys will have copies of my slides, um, have already had radiation treatment. So, so this sounds like a patient who has had radiation and now has relapsed and is interested in, in various options. So yes, please look at these slides. They will be available to the group. Um, Don P is asking, I was taken off Lupron last year from new oncologist who said it was duplication of abiraterone. At that point, he said it was useless. Was that correct? Um, I was diagnosed with metastatic CRPC in 2019. PSA and testosterone numbers are now rising, okay? Had first PSMA test yesterday, so waiting for results. Should I go back on Lupron? Okay, so um, a year ago, there was an abstract released at ASCO 2021 saying that people already on uh, people on Lupron and abiraterone together. Because typically one is on Lupron and then one is then placed on abiraterone. Um, turns out that in a lot of men, the abiraterone by itself without the Lupron is doing the same job as the Lupron plus abiraterone. At the end of the day, the goal is to, to lower the testosterone. And abiraterone, by the way it works, does lower the testosterone. So there is a movement to using less uh, Lupron if someone is already on abiraterone. Um, measurable low testosterone on abiraterone, we, we can't say for sure that is clinically the same as someone on abiraterone on Lupron. But if the, if the testosterone is low, intuitively Lupron seems redundant. Um, but we need a little bit of long-term follow-up to, to look at testosterone levels. Um, so this gentleman, he's off um, Lupron, but it looks like he's on abiraterone and seems like Dan's testosterone numbers are rising while he's on abiraterone. So that, that would suggest that uh, if the PSA is rising, when the testosterone is rising, we're actually not talking about castrate resistance anymore. We're talking about castrate sensitive disease, meaning as the testosterone goes up, the cancer grows. So intuitively, I try to lower the testosterone back down and see if the, PSM, uh, the PSA starts dropping. And the way to do that would be, uh, if you wanna work fast, you could use the Firmigon or Orgovix if, or simply just going back on Lupron would be uh, an option as well. Next question is, um, let's see here. Bill L, may I ask how the pandemic has affected pro prostate oncologist specialists? Um, sure, I, you know, the number one, we, we lost an excellent doctor, Dr. Turner. Um, Dr. Scholz just was unable to support three oncologists. Um, I'm working part-time, which uh, you know, was uh, asked of me and, and I'm okay with that for now. Uh, but I think things are with, with Medicare and, and we've also stopped taking a lot of insurance company uh, uh, insurances because of um, very lot, a lot of paperwork for very little reimbursement. So, so these are some of the business decisions that uh, Dr. Scholz had to make. Um, but, um, and, and obviously we had to, if, if you don't know already, we have a kind of a membership type concierge model now. Um, and so we're, we're doing okay, we're surviving. Um, I'm still working part-time if that answers your question. Um, we are able to do more uh, virtual meetings and get reimbursed at a decent amount. Uh, we can't do telephone consults because it doesn't pay anything. So, um, but we are able to see patients virtually and I think we'll be okay. So thank you for, for, for wondering and caring. So uh, next patient, Dan, uh, Daniel Santo P. He's asking, uh, I am 78. After three years of surveillance since diagnosis, I recently had a PSMA PET scan, which showed no metastatic disease. Is there any limited treatment that would make sense for someone my age? I mean, 78 is, 
not that old. So I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't pick a treatment or determine a treatment based specifically on your age. Uh, there are many patients who are in their 70s who are strong, healthy, doesn't have that many um, illnesses, who will vary make it to 90. So, so um, or more uh, with medical uh, science nowadays. So, I, I would I would not you know write you off just because you're 78. Um, a lot of it will have to do with uh, what other illnesses you have, um, how's your current quality of life, what type of urinary or sexual symptoms you have, what you uh, what quality of life you are willing to give up. Um, and, and if you were interested in some sort of treatment to the prostate in someone who doesn't have metastatic disease, um, one could consider either um, probably some type of radiation. I probably wouldn't subject you to surgery, of course. So if we, if we wanted to, we could do some sort of radiation therapy to the prostate, and that can still potentially cure someone as, as yourself. And if we, um, even in the radiation uh, approach, we are working with UCLA using what we call focal radiation therapy. So not only are we minimizing side effects by not treating the whole prostate, we're treating just the, prost the, the side of the prostate where there's cancer. So oftentimes we could get away with treating half the prostate with half the side effects. Um, and if we decided not to go about going for cure, which you know, not everyone needs to go for cure, uh, one can contain the cancer simply with uh, medications. One can use um, low-dose Casidex, intermittent Lupron. Um, so that will contain the cancer for a good, potentially, you know, 10, 20 years just by taking medications like one would take cholesterol medicines, for example. So lots of options. Uh, that's why one really needs to tailor the treatment to the person, not just looking at a person saying he's 78 you can't do this, this, and this. Okay, so next question by Hirsch K. Um, in Germany, there are clinics that offer single lutetium 177 treatment for uh, hormone sensitive prostate cancer and hormone or castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, you know, I, I still believe in a little bit more long term data um, before I, I subject people to using lutetium at hormone sensitive prostate cancer. It's promising, it probably will work. The question is how long of a remission one will get before one needs uh, Lupron, for example. Um, the other, um, or, or will it be better for, if someone's already on Lupron, will adding one or two doses of lutetium 177 move the needle or change that person's outcome? Uh, we definitely need a lot more data before I would do that. Um, for example, you know, uh, we've learned that some of these side effects from radiation treatments come, come later, like five to 10 years later. So what if you got one or two doses of lutetium and then 10 years later, you got some blood cancer like leukemia. And then we found out that, oh yeah, people get lutetium later on, do get leukemia. So I, I would probably hold off on hormone sensitive prostate cancer as these people can, you know, live many, many years. So may not want to expose someone to radiation that early. For the metastatic castrate uh, resistant prostate cancer, you know, using one or two doses before taxotere, I mean, I, I think that's what they're studying on and we'll have data on very soon. I, I would, I'm open to that approach. And, um, you know, I've, I've had some patients where I feel like I don't want to give them chemo, but I'm optimistic LU177 will work. Um, and so we, we, we do that. We find a way to do that. Next question. Pat is asking, uh, is this the same Pat? <laughs> so basically I've been taking Zytiga for 18 months, but it appears that it is losing its effectiveness. The PSA rose from 0.06 to 2.6. Um, so I have to have a plan as to which treatment as the next step. That's why I need the, the slides. Yes. So, um, Gotcha. So, you know, just to answer your question, Pat, um, now that you have what we call castrate resistant prostate cancer that is uh, not responding to Zytiga, a, depending on the amount of cancer one has, 
Um, one can just simply switch to enzalutamide, darolutamide, any of the lutamides. So apalutamide, enzalutamide, darolutamide. And you might want to ask your doctor to check a ARV7 gene test. And if you do have that mutation, these three drugs will not work. So then it'll be a waste of your time. But if you don't have these mutations, you can consider using those three drugs. And there's about a 30, 40% success rate. So it's, it's an easy switch without needing to jump to chemo or liquid radiation. Um, it also will be helpful to know what your scans show. Um, given that your PSA is still fairly low, you probably don't have a lot of cancer. So you have some time to, to potentially just try the uh, next generation um, androgen receptor inhibitors. Next patient, Jerry H. Um, I just started Orgovix plus Dubeca but no chemotherapy. I have approximately three sites of metastatic disease in the pelvic area. So this, Jerry, you're, you're a good example of probably not needing chemotherapy since you only have three spots. Um, but the combination of Orgovix plus Nubeca, and uh, if you're able to do radiation, you, you could potentially have a five to seven year long-term remission. Um, and even if you if you do eventually relapse, um, because you've had these drugs, your time to relapse and your overall survival is better than if you just had the Orgovix or just uh, alone without the Nubeca. So I think this is an appropriate um, treatment for you, Jerry. Uh, next question from Bob A. Uh, presumably early action for salvage treatment would be best. After initial treatment, i.e. prostatectomy, PSA rise was first detected. At what PSA level is imaging techniques likely to be effective, including PSMA PET scan? So the, um, we've, we've learned that salvage treatment is, um, so the, the first question to Bob's, Bob, uh, the first answer to Bob's question is, should he actually, this is a learning point here, should he have done radiation therapy uh, right after surgery, even before the PSA rose. Uh, research is leaning towards no. It is okay to wait for the PSA to rise before doing radiation therapy. There are some caveats to this statement, but in general, uh, we are letting the PSA rise a bit before we immediately make the patient, the post-surgical patient undergo radiation therapy. One big reason for not doing radiation so early is the patient still re recovering uh, sexually and urinary wise from surgery, you don't wanna then slam the patient with radiation therapy so quickly after surgery. So you wanna have a reason to do the radiation therapy. And the, the consensus now is to wait for the PSA to go to 0 0.20 or above, although it may be radiation can be used at a PSA 0.15 and above. And then the question is, do you just radiate at 0.15, 0 0.20, or do you wait for a PET scan to show something that's lighting up? So we do tend to use uh, PET scans now. So if someone is at 0 0.20, if the PET scan, uh, the PSMA PET scan lit up in the prostate bed, we would feel very confident that radiation to the prostate bed would be beneficial. The question is, if the PSMA PET scan is negative and the PSA is 0 0.20, do we go ahead and radiate anyway? We don't have a great answer for that, but we know that if the PET scan is negative, but yet if we let the PSA rose to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, will the cure rate be lowered simply because we're waiting for more cancer to grow, even though we never saw it at 0 0.20? So that is the big question. Um, we don't have a firm answer on that, but the, my tendency is to, at 0 0.20, regardless of the PET scan, at least talk about the pros and cons of radiating the prostate bed. Um, and then to answer uh, Bob's question, I do wait till about 0 0.20 to, before I do the PSMA PET scan, even though there is data showing even at 0 0.10, the PSMA PET scan occasionally will pick up cancer. Um, so oh, 0.20 would be my answer. Gotcha. A little caveat to that is, uh, do you, do you uh, track the uh, bounce back in, or, or the changing level in testosterone in assessing the PSA level? Yes. So 
when someone has, the, that's a great question, Aaron. So typically, if a patient has a low testosterone, uh, their PSA is going to relapse slower because they're kind of on a mild anti-cancer treatment because they were, they have a low testosterone. So we do want to interpret a, a PSA in the context of a testosterone level. So if a patient has, for example, testosterone 80, which is not castrate, but it's, fair, it's quite low, and the PSA is already at 0.15, we would extrapolate that if the testosterone was 300, the PSA probably would be higher. So we, we would start the process of scanning and treatment um, earlier when someone has a low testosterone level. Now, oftentimes people have a fairly normal or low normal testosterone level, like 200, 300, and they, and, and they had surgery. The testosterone level is not gonna fluctuate that much day to day. So we're, we're not gonna check a testosterone every single time we check a PSA, that's probably not needed. Mm -hmm. So if, um, so with the, the 0.15, uh, or 0.2 being kind of the, the point at which um, the uh, uh, cancer would be detectable. You know, it, suppose that assumes a normal testosterone level. Um, do you think that the PSM, PSMA test would show up anything if the, the PSA was only say 0.1 and the testosterone was really low? What I'm getting at is, is, is that it, it, is it purely correlated to the PSA as kind of being like an activity factor of the cancer? Or, or is it more of like the volume of the cancer where, you know, if, if your testosterone is zero, the cancer might still be there. It's just not really active. Will, will that show up on the PSA, uh, PSMA scan? Right. So I guess officially we, we're not completely sure. Um, but um, there's pro there's, we're, we're probably not sure if 0.15 with a low T is the same as 0.20 with a normal T in terms of sensitivity of the PSMA PET scan, correct. Uh, in terms of treatment though, I think that that's where one has a little bit more uh, rationale to go ahead and treat at 0.15 versus 0.20. Sure. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so next question is by Bill L again. What about ADT holidays to delay castrate resistance? So. That question was um, answered about eight, nine years ago that ADT holidays do not delay castrate resistance. Mm -hmm. So ADT holidays, the main benefit is you get an ADT holiday and it, and in general does not, um, does not uh, speed up castrate resistance. So you, you get treatment holidays where you don't have to feel tired, hot flashes, breast discomfort, bone loss, and you get a better quality of life when you're not on treatment. Now, the caveat is in the metastatic setting, it turns out that ADT holidays may even speed up castrate resistance. So the more metastatic disease you have, one does not do uh, ADT holidays. So keep that in mind. If you have oligometastatic, I think it's safe to do an ADT holiday. But if you have probably five or more spots, um, it's a long discussion about maybe not having an ADT holiday. Okay. All right, next question by Jean, my friend. Isn't constant exercise helpful in tolerating and reducing uh, side effects of treatment? For sure, 100% yes. So um, in the metastatic setting, given that we are treating this like a chronic condition, we definitely want to impl implement a, a, a lifestyle uh, change, which is uh, exercising more with uh, not just cardio, but weights uh, to build, to prevent muscle loss and maybe even build to muscle, prevent bone loss. And uh, basically, you know, just thinking about it logically, you're, you want to be strong and in fighting shape as, as you go on this journey of fighting the cancer. If you, if you get weaker and weaker from each subsequent treatment, you may not qualify or tolerate the next treatment and you might lose some opportunities to get treatments that may be prolonged your life. So uh, that is definitely a very important part of um, uh, managing metastatic disease. Thanks for bringing that up, Gene. Yeah, yeah I, and that uh, jogs my memory of hearing something about um, the use of metformin uh, with, um, with, during treatment in order to, you know, like, a, you know, essentially assist. 
Um, and, you know, it was, it, it was promoted as like, oh yeah, actually, you know, people, people that are on metformin, you know, they, they have like better response or, you know, better, better, uh, you know, response to the treatment or, or, you know, longer life expectancy. But what they didn't really like, you know, um, show was that, hey, actually, if you, you know, exercise, you know, a lot more, actually, that's even more beneficial than just, you know, taking this additional drug. Right, or- right. So I think metformin's a little bit of a, just kind of like a cherry on top. It's not going to change one's overall destiny that much, except for preventing or maybe helping with uh, the obesity side effects of androgen deprivation therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent. Um, by, by the way, I'm, I'm also a little bit curious um, if, uh, what are kind of the signs of, I mean, besides actually doing a, a PSA test or a PSMA scan, uh, what are the, uh, I guess, other side effects that you might see if you start believing you're having uh, metastatic uh, cancer, such as like it, it's invading the lungs or the liver or something like that? Sure. So the PSA, so first of all, the, the PSA is a really good marker of metastatic disease. So when you do a PSA and the PSA, if the PSA is rising, uh, 95% chance there is, or 99% chance there is cancer growing. Um, and there's a very good correlation between the PSA level and the amount of cancer. So it's very unlikely that you'll feel symptoms of metastatic disease before the PSA rises above 10. Okay. So um, one w- way I look at it, I describe it as, let's say this much cancer is someone dying from cancer. This much cancer is pain. This much cancer is you see the cancer and the PSA is measuring this much cancer. So PSA is basically measuring invisible cancer, basically. Gotcha. So you're not gonna feel any symptoms unless the PSA is rising, except for that one scenario where you have what we call the neuroendocrine dedifferentiated metastatic disease. That is almost a, it's almost like a different animal. So the PSA could be low and there's prostate cancer growing. So, Mm -hmm. um, and, but you, and, and in that situation, you, you can't go testing everyone even if their PSA is low. You're just gonna have to accept that that happens in the rare scenario. And in that case, the treatment is very uh, different too. Um, so you, you, would, you still do the ADT, which doesn't work that long, but this, this is when you use early chemotherapy, early PARP inhibitors um, to uh, get the cancer under control. Gotcha, interesting, interesting, all right. Well, um, yeah, I think that wraps up all the questions. Uh, we certainly had a huge number of questions from, from I think, what was our, our you know, highest attendance <laughs> since we've been doing these Zoom meetings. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. It was Great. very informative. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and uh, I guess we will hopefully have you back in, in another few months uh, to a year. Sound good? Great. Great. My pleasure. All right. Take care, doctor. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.